The goal of life should not be to eliminate your problems, but elevate the problems you work towards solving. We were trying to get to a point where there was no subjectivity, there was no interpretation of the data. It was just factual. And the more that we can do that with our own life, the better off we're going to be. And everybody else is saying that would be miserable or I have to go outside. Even today, it's cold. I'm like, yeah, I like this. This is how it's supposed to be. There's a lot of other things you could be doing, but that's the trade-off. But unless you're willing to give value or trade, then you're actually not improving. You're just coasting. That's the ease of modernity that we live in. You're not going to starve if you don't hunt, but that's what makes it so meaningful. You choose to do it. This is Ryan Mickler with Order of Man, and you are listening to The Wild Initiative. Put down your latte and pull on your boots. You and I and everybody listening to this owns 640 million acres. I think he killed more deer drinking his coffee, smoking a cigarette in the pickup truck than I did spending all that time freezing my butt off. Something that I would hope is that people realize that those are wild animals and they have savage natures. I look forward to packing animals out. I look forward to that pain of success. Doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter where you live. I've said it before and you know what? I'll say it again louder for the people in the back. Your present circumstance should not limit your passions. This is Jay Scott of the Jay Scott Outdoors podcast. Hey, this is Ryan Callahan. Hi, this is Jules McQueen. Hey everybody, Jason Carter here with Epic Outdoors. Hey guys, this is Tim Burnett with Solo Hunter. You're listening to The Wild Initiative. Hey y'all, welcome to another episode of The Wild Initiative brought to you as part of the Waypoint Podcast Network. All right, so hopping into today's episode, I have returning to the podcast after two years, almost like within a couple of weeks. I was looking at looking at the date; it was early December last time we spoke. But he's back, y'all. The uh, the founder of my favorite misogynistic cult, um, <laughs> <laughs> and the worst cult ever. Yeah, I know. Uh, the one and only Ryan Mickler of Order of Man uh, in the Iron Council. Ryan, man, thanks for taking the time uh, hopping on. Yeah, what's up, brother? It's good to see you again. I, I know we we see each other. We don't communicate necessarily a whole lot, but we see each other each and every week in the Iron Council. Uh, but I can't believe it's been two years. Is that right? Since we've last done a podcast together? Yeah, I was feeling like I was, I was looking at it. I reached out again. I'm like, oh, yeah, it'd be good to catch up after you. I'm like, no, man, it's been two years. Yeah. I mean, crazy is a lot. A lot has changed for both of us. I'm sure in that time frame. Oh yeah, and you know, I mean, it's like it, it, to some extent, you know, I think for both of us, life did keep going. You know, we didn't necessarily shut down, but so much of the world like shut down in 2020 that it just kind of it almost like disappeared. <laughs> it's like mm. it's. I try and remember a lot of what I did in 2020, and if it wasn't for I feel like Facebook memories or something. I'm not, I'm not sure I'd really have a huge recollection yeah. of all the stuff I did. Yeah. It's pretty wild. You know, I, I don't think it should have shut down. I don't think people should have shut it down. I, I think they should have just gone on with living their lives. And I hope people are waking up to that fact and they will continue to live their lives and they'll not delete an entire year, 365 days of what they could have otherwise created in that time frame. But this is the result of, believing that, you know, a government has your best interest at heart or they care about you or they care about your, your liberty and your freedom and your health. They don't care about any of that. And that, if that isn't evident to you at this point, I just don't know what to tell you. <laughs> it's a, you would think that these past couple of years, you know, what, it, what was it? Uh, two weeks to, uh, or what was it? Five weeks to flatten the curve. Was that the, was that the same you know, uh, no. I think it was like 15 days to flatten the curve. Was that, so was that weeks. it? Like two weeks? Yeah. Jeez. yeah. Uh, I, I saw a post, uh, one of my friends, Zuby, uh, who has been on the podcast a couple of times now said something like, uh, the, the, the hardest part of two or 15 days to flatten the curve is the first 600 days. <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> and that's, that's what it's been at this point. It's I've, just been, I think I remember that bullshit. post. I think I remember him putting up that post, but it's just, yeah. It's insane to me. And, you know, I mean, the only reason I, I'm at where I'm at now is because in fair, part of it was I was lucky enough to get out of Southern California in just enough time to <laughs> to avoid that that cluster down there. But then uh, just the fact that I did, I it's like, OK, the world shut down, but I didn't sit on my couch and stuff my face and say, woe is me. And in part, thanks to my involvement 
in the Iron Council and the encouragement from the other guys there, I set out and I used that time to improve myself and find ways. And my business expanded more in that year than it did. It, it, it has since or it did before. It's, it's wild. It should. And, and I don't think that's a surprise necessarily. Uh, some people might find it surprising. Uh, but when you're free of distractions and clutter and bullshit and nonsense, you can really put your head down and put your heart into some work that's actually meaningful. I, I think about that. So I've been out here in Maine uh, with my family now for three years. And so this will be, well, so about two and a half years, this will be our third winter. And I'm noticing a phenomenon over the past couple of winters, and I'm sure it'll be the same this year, is I get more done in the winter than just about any other time of the year. And when I say winter, I'm talking about winter, you know, roads close, shops close, getting snowed in, power being out, because I'm just, every year I'm on this yearly opportunity to just reset and not have to think about who I need to talk with, not have to jump on a bunch of phone calls or jump online or check social media. And I can write and I can journal and I can think and I can play games with my family. And so the, the, the deal that people have been faced with in 2021 with this reaction to COVID is something I have the great fortune of dealing with every single winter. <laughs> and you know, what's interesting about it is I, I wouldn't have done it if I wasn't presented with it. Right. Like, I, I, I don't know that I would have found out that I can be so, so productive in these, what other people would call downtimes. Uh, it's been, it's been pretty awesome. I've been pretty fortunate that way. Yeah. It's, I, I recognize that in myself. Cause I, I mean, I'm kind of in a similar place where I'm at now. Uh, I'll be, I'm going into my first winter here. Um, I mean, I'm three miles from in, where, where are you at again? I, I'm in Northern Montana now. Montana. So yeah, right. I, uh, okay. I was originally down in the Bozeman area for the last year. And I, I just came up here, uh, uh, you know, we were talking earlier, I, I got a, a property on seven acres. Like it was just too good of a deal to pass up. I mean, I was paying, uh, I was paying almost 1900 bucks a month for a three bedroom townhouse in the Bozeman area. Like it was, I was dying. I was drowning in that. And, uh, well, that's good probably compared to Southern Utah. I mean, excuse me, Southern California. Uh, it's probably about the same at this point. Um, like the Bozeman area has grown so much. It's insane. It is absolutely insane. This was outside of Bozeman. Technically this was in Belgrade, like the next town over. It's kind of like, you know, Boulder, Boulder is to Denver. And, uh, and so I'm like drowning in this. I, I, you know, it's just busy. I'm renting a place, which I never wanted to do again. Um, and this opportunity came up for a property up here in Northern Montana. And I'll be honest. I looked at it as a joke. I'm like, Oh, let me look at this place. That's like three miles from the border. And then I was like, yeah, I kind of need to get out for this weekend. It'd be a good idea. You know, just travel up and check out new part of Montana. And a day later I was putting an offer on the place. <laughs> um, I don't blame you, man. I tell my wife, I'm like, so we're in pretty, we're about an hour and a half North of Portland, Maine. And so we're in the foothills of, of, of the main, you know, mountain range, which is the start of the Appalachian trail. But I, you know, I, I've talked to my wife, I'm like, let's keep moving North. She's like, this is as far North as I go. If you go <laughs> any more North, you're going by yourself. And I'm like, that's eh, actually pretty tempting. So I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe once the kids are out of the house, you know, we'll, we'll buy a place up there and I can convince her to come visit me every once in a while. But uh, yeah, man, the further North I can get, the better off I feel. That's for sure. It's a, it's a little weird getting used to, uh, I mean, it being daylight until 10 o'clock, uh, during the summer so weird. and then so weird. now it getting dark at like four o'clock. <laughs> yeah. I sit and, yeah, yeah. It's literally like three 30 ish or so right here now. I'm sure that's very much the same for you. It's like, you look outside, like it's nighttime. I'm like, no, it's actually still daytime. If I look at my watch, like what in the world is going on? That's an adjustment, but it's it's a small price to pay for being left alone. That's for sure. Oh, it's it's just glorious out here. And it, the nice thing is, I had now have well while it's overwhelming, I now have an endless amount of projects to keep me keep me occupied and keep me out of trouble. Out of Lord knows what, forty miles yeah. from the from the nearest bar, which is great. Not that I not that I went out or drank that much, anyways. But it was it's like. Every decision I make now There's, has to be carefully considered. 
there's another, there's another benefit. And I think you'll find this is that it keeps all the yuppies away. <laughs> this you is know, definitely like, like people, not like, the town for it. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So like Montana in general, I think you're probably going to get some people who are wealthy, who are coming up from California and from some of these other wealthier places. And they'll, they'll be fair weather fans, you know, and, and, and some of them will, will stick around during the winter because it's beautiful and whatnot. And they have the amenities too, but the further North you go, the more rural you get, it keeps those yuppies away. You know, that's, that's kind of how I felt with, with Maine is like, you know, yeah. In the, in the coastal cities in Portland, you have people from Connecticut and Massachusetts and whatnot come up and, you know, that's fine. They call it vacation land. So they come up here in the summer and they enjoy the beauty in the lakes and the, and the water and the mountains and everything else. And then, you know, it gets a little cold and they run. I'm like, good good riddance. See you later. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not somebody who's grown up. I grew up in Southern California too. You're, you're from, are you from Southern California originally? Oh yeah. Born in Long Beach, grew up in Seal Beach. Yeah. Yeah. So I grew up in Anaheim. Um, so I spent a lot of time, Yorba Linda more specifically, yep. most people yep. don't know Yorba Linda, but since you're familiar with the area and, and so I didn't grow up with this lifestyle. And then I moved to a very small town in Southern Utah when I was 13 or 14 years old and I was introduced to the redneck way of life and hunting and outdoors and (laughs) being a cowboy. Uh, and at first I really resisted. I remember one morning I woke up right after we had moved there and our, my, my bedroom was on the second floor of the house that we lived in that we, that my stepfather had built. Uh, and it overlooked the road and that road, I can't remember the road. I want to say it was like 300 mm, East, maybe ran straight up to the, uh, what, what we call Parowan Canyon, which went up to the, the ski resort up there. And so I woke up one morning and it was early, must've been four or five, six o'clock. And I heard this God awful sound. I'm like, what in the world <laughs> is that? And I looked out my window and I saw cowboys like legitimate cowboys that I only saw in city slickers or the movies or whatever else. I'm like, what? And they had cows and they had horses and they were driving what they, what they were doing. And I didn't know at the time is they were taking their cows off the mountain for the winter and they were bringing them down to pasture and, and putting them up and whatnot. But, um, you know, that's kind of when I was introduced to this, this different way of life and Southern Utah has really grown. It's, it's kind of turning into this, this, this haven for, for Californians that have voted for, uh, liberal policies their entire life. And they're trying to escape it now. And they're going to just ruin it by voting for the same policies that got them to where they were before. Uh, and mm-hmm. so we made this move and, you know, I'm introduced to Mainers, a Maina and <laughs> it's awesome. I love these people. Like they're hardy, they're salt of the earth type people. Uh, there's a phrase, there's a, a, a phrase that people use up here called you're either, you're either preparing for or dealing with winter and they're worried about staying alive and they're worried about keep, keeping their houses home, uh, warm and they're worried about taking care of their neighbors and chopping wood. You know, I see people in the summer chopping wood and then in the winter they're using it and I see that wood pile. There's one down the road. I see that wood pile they have outside just gradually w- w- dwindle down to nothing and then it starts to get warm and they build it right back up. It's a pretty cool it's a pretty cool thing. And I, I think this is kind of like how life is supposed to be, but to go back to my point earlier, you know, we see all these yuppies that are moving in from places that vote in all these liberal policies and ruin what they're like locusts, like ruin whatever goodness was in that area. And then they, they just consume all the resources and consume all the goodness out of the environment. They're like, well, I guess we got to leave here. And then they move on like locusts to the next crop that they want to decimate. It's unfortunate. But the winter and the cold keeps it away, keeps them away, keeps them at bay. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you see that all over the place. Like you said, you see it in southern Utah. You see it in places like Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. You see it. Yeah, in, I mean, same. Colorado is is so far gone at this point. Like there's almost no hope for it. And you look, it's happening here in Montana down in Bozeman. Like we're Like I said, I was paying ridiculous amounts because thousands of people are moving in and the majority of those people are, I mean, I feel like I became a true Montanan not too long ago when I I was on, I was on Facebook and told someone to move, move back to California. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) Uh, Yeah, Montana's horrible. Maine is horrible. You guys don't want anything to do with it. Just stay away. 
I will say up here, I don't really have to exaggerate too much because it's I'm you know, I'm not in like the nice mountainous part of Montana. I mean, we have the uh, <laughs> we have a range just south of us uh, about an hour. But like I'm I'm where I'm at. It's flat. Like you can see my house from three miles away when you're driving. You're like, oh, look, there's Sam's place. And so the wind comes howling through here and I'm planting I'm planting trees like a crazy person right now. So hopefully in three to five years, I'll have a little bit of a windbreak. Uh, but, uh, this wind comes howling through and during the winter, it'll get down to negative 60 here. Um, negative 60. That's Damn. what I've been told. Negative 50 and 60. That's colder than, is this your first year up there? It's not my first year in Montana, but my first winter not up Montana, here. Montana, but where yeah. you are. Yeah. And, uh, so I'm, I'm really excited to not be able to go outside without literally bundling up my face to be able to breathe. Yeah. I guess when it gets to that cold, you can't even breathe without it oh, I'm sure. damaging your lungs. I think that's awesome. You know, I, I'm, I'm maybe I'm a bit of a masochist or whatever, but I think that's awesome. Like the, one of the first things we did when we moved up here is we, yeah, I talked to people about like, Hey, what do we need? And they said, you need to have a good heating system. You need to have a backup system. You need to have a good plow. Like, okay, well, I don't have any of that stuff. So the first thing we did, we moved to the home is we upgraded our heating system. We poured like 45 grand into oh, wow. updating our heating system. We got this commercial oil boiler. We had the guy come in and do the manifold and all the copper wire. Like he did a phenomenal job. It looks awesome and works really well. And then I'm like, okay, well, what next? And like, well, what if that goes out? I'm like, uh, will it? And they're like, yeah, oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's going to go out. I'm like, well, how long is it going to go out for? They're like, I don't know a day, two weeks. I don't know. Okay. So what do I need? And they said, get a generator. Okay. So I got it. And I'm not talking about your little Honda generator that you go get a home Depot. Yeah. You I'm don't, you don't about, fill that up. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm talking about a generator that's hooked up to a 250 gallon propane tank directly connected to your, your power grid in your home. So that when now, when my power goes out and it does every year, multiple times, that thing within five, 10 seconds kicks right on and I have power to the house. I'm like, okay, got that. They said, you need a plow. I'm like, cool. So I spent six grand on getting a, a Fisher plow, the best of the best, put that thing on my truck and we got it all dialed in. We probably spent, I don't know, 80, 80 grand or so getting the stuff dialed in. I love it, man. Like I, <laughs> when it's about to storm and people are hunkering in and everybody else is saying that would be miserable or I have to go outside. Even today it's 20, I don't know, 22, 23 degrees. I go outside. It's cold. I'm like, yeah, I like this. This is how it's supposed to be. It's I'm with you on that. I am like relishing. I'm, and it's like in the fifties right now. And don't get me wrong. Like I love the warm weather too. Like I love being able to walk around in a t-shirt, go outside, you know, uh, mess around with the dogs outside. Enjoy that uh, a little bit more. But like, I'm ready. I'm ready for winter to kick in, man. It's time. Like summer's, yeah. summer's the time for summer. Winter's the time for you winter. Are now. You oh, are now. Yeah. Look, if you're talking about playing around with the dogs outside, it sounds like you ought to just go ahead and get a sled team. And, <laughs> and you can still go ahead and play with the dogs outside in the winter. Well, I'm, I'm looking at getting some, uh, some additional dogs. Eventually I want, I want some dogs that are, I'm looking at actually GSPs that, uh, you know, I could, I could use them as a sled team, but, uh, um, what's it, what is that? I don't know. Uh, that German, is. German short hair, German short haired pointers. Um, so oh, kind yeah, of the, okay. the white and Brown, uh, spotted, um, they're Got bird it. dogs typically. And, but I love them cause they're, they're like pets and bird dog they're and working dogs. And I want some that's, I don't just want to get a working dog that like lives in the barn and, you know, isn't fun. No, dude, I want a dog that's going to middle of the night, jump up on the bed and make my life miserable. Uh, <laughs> um, but all the power to you. I don't uh, want that. No dogs <laughs> on my bed, no dogs on my couches. You can be a member of the family, but you don't get a bed or a couch to lay on. You can get a, a pillow or a dog bed from Petco, but you ain't sleeping on my bed and you ain't sleeping on the couches. That's for sure. Uh, they only get to sleep in the bed because I'm single. That's <laughs> Fair enough. It, Fair and enough. it gets it gets cold. The wood stove's on the other side of the All house. Right. Legit. That's, a, that's acceptable. <laughs> acceptable answer. But, you know, it's funny. It's like, uh, you know, you bring up like craving these hardships. And I think it's it's such a funny thing. Like, I think true men, you know, and we probably talked about this before on the last podcast, but like true men crave hardship. And I think that's what 
causes so much depression and you hear about men are so susceptible to depression these days. It's like, it's cause our lives are easy. You know, it's so it, easy. You know, I can, I can go get my damn hot pocket, throw it in the microwave and call it a day. Or, you know, I can, you know, go out and shoot a deer and process it and, you know, spend days finding the deer. I want a deer. I want to shoot and process it and uh, cook that, cook that whole meal from that meat myself. And what's going to bring a lot more satisfaction and leave me at the end of the day, feeling like a more comprehensive, complete man, you know, I look, I, I think you say, man, I actually think it's human nature to look for problems. You know, it's look, I wrote this today on Twitter, which is like totally indicative of the times that we live like i'm complaining on twitter that i have this amazing <laughs> technology and I'm bitching and moaning on twitter with 140 characters or whatever it is so i, I said some you know let me just pull it up here real quick because i think this is an important an important topic and and you're hitting on it here and so here's what i wrote uh let me find it here which on a side note right. i like all my social media po- like it pushes to twitter like my my instagram and my facebook both do but the only time I legitimately go to Twitter and post something specifically for it is to bitch about something. I, I will admit that something about yeah, Twitter, the Twitter verse yeah. is solely for it. And it's typically it gets results from whatever company I'm bitching about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a shit show. There's no doubt about it, but also, I mean, it is what you make of it too. Right? Yeah. It's just a tool. Oh, yeah. If you use it incorrectly, then, you know, if I used a shovel incorrectly or maybe a hammer is a better, better, example if i used a hammer and smashed the shit out of my thumb then is that the hammer's fault or is that my fault well that's my fault because i was i was not proficient with the tool so here's what i wrote we all have so few we all have so few real problems to worry about that we make up dumb shit to fret over i'm convinced since we can't escape our propensity to worry that the goal of life should not be to eliminate your problems but elevate the problems you work towards solving so we've got this, this like natural inclination to just look for problems, to be upset about something, to see the what's wrong with the world or our current environment. That actually is a good thing. That's, that's evolutionarily hardwired into our brain. Because for example, if we're dealing with winter, like you and I have been talking about for the last 30 minutes, and we don't consider that a problem, I'm not going to chop wood. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to spend money on getting a system. I'm not going to get the backup power. Like I'm not going to do any of that. And guess what's going to happen? I'm going to die. Now we live in a relative ease of modernity, which in this case, I won't die because I've got insulation. I've got a house. I can shield myself from the elements. I've got neighbors who would help me out if I came to that situation, but we're all looking for problems inevitably. So rather than just running away from all the problems we have, I think we ought to solve the problems that we're dealing with so that we can move on to better problems, not move away from them entirely. Like, for example, uh, this was roughly, give or take, 15 years ago. My wife and I bought our first home in southern Utah, and it stretched us financially. And there was days where I came home and I would literally wear a dirt track into the grass in our backyard on that two tenths of an acre lot that we had, I would, I would wear this dirt track because I would pace around it consumed with how I was going to make the mortgage payment. Well, you know, right now in my life, fortunately, and and I'm grateful for it. I'm not in a position where I need to worry about the mortgage payment. That's a problem we've solved. And what that does is that frees me up now to move on to bigger and better problems things that are more meaningful, things that are more significant, things I get real value from. And isn't that where we find value? Not from running away from issues, but in making ourselves capable of dealing with them. Like Bruce Lee's famous quote is, uh, don't, and I'm paraphrasing, don't pray for an easier life, pray for the strength to endure a difficult one. Mm-hmm. And that's part of the reason I like where I'm at because it's hard, man. You got to go out and move snow and you're cold and you're wet and you're miserable and it's dark. And I'm like, this is awesome. This makes me tougher. And there's no other situation in life outside of environments. I put myself in like, um, jujitsu is one hunting. Like Mm -hmm. you just mentioned is, is one 
where you're actually thrusting yourself into physical hardship. Cause you're right. If I go buy uh, a pack of hot dogs at Walmart, look, I love hot dogs just like any other man, <laughs> but a hot dog's a hot dog. Okay. But if I go shoot an elk that I spent seven or 10 days tracking and stalking, and then not to mention the countless hours of learning how to shoot a bow and be active, Accurate and get my physical fitness in, in to the level where I could actually go perform at that level. And then I bring that home and I eat that elk and have a little elk stew or a little elk steak or have some backstrap. Man, that backstrap tastes pretty damn good. And it has less to do with the taste and more to do with how, how hard you had to actually work for it. Well, I mean, it comes down to it, we choose our problems. If, you know, if we can either choose legitimate problems that are going to help us grow and, and, and move us forward, or we can make dumb shit up to get butt hurt about. And I don't get me wrong. Like I've been guilty of this countless amounts of times where I've caught myself. I'm like, why am I so upset about this? Like it, whether it's a, a dear Lord, I've had to unfollow so many, like uh, I follow some of our politicians here, some of our conservative politicians in Montana on Facebook. And, you know, they'll make a post and I'll like it and I'll go to comment or, you know, just leave an encouraging comment, whatever. And I see, I see like half of the state sitting there and it's like a lovely picture of, uh, you know, uh, Steve Daines, our senator, our uh, U.S. senator uh, on a horseback with his wife. And some some a hole is in there, you know, like, oh, if you really gave a shit about Montana, you'd be blah, 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 mask mandates and blah, 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 vaccinations and that, that, that. And I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I feel the I feel the, the blood rising in my face, you know, and and I'm sitting there. I'm like, why am I upset over this? And I, I have to catch myself and pull myself back because I'm making up problems that are consuming my mind. And I'll sit and think about that for like an hour instead of doing something productive and going out and, and, and actually now when I do that, I, I stop, I'll get my ass up out of my computer chair, you know, pause whatever podcast I'm listening to and go like chop wood or do something that's like solving a real problem I'm going to deal with. And, and it helps me put all of that stuff into perspective. Then I come back and I start up my work again and I'm like, okay, I don't really give a shit about that person. They have no effect on my life and in any tangible way. Um, so, I mean, it comes down to, we choose our problems and, and not everyone can do like effectively what we've done, move up to, you know, mid, uh, Northern Maine, move out to BFN, Montana, you know, uh, it's not everyone can do that. I get it, but there's other things in life that you can take on, whether that's like you said, jujitsu, or again, you know, this is generally a hunting podcast, hunting and i think putting yourself in those situations where your decisions actually are to some extent life and death maybe not so much jujitsu but it's the difference between your ass getting choked out and and you walking away uh without somebody slapping you awake um it, Which it has happened <laughs> i've heard you i've heard you tell Multiple some of those times. stories on uh yes. on the friday calls um I mean, but, you know, you're out in the wilderness, you're hunting. The decisions you make in any given moment can be life and death, whether that's, you know, how, you know, how you interact with wildlife or the path you choose to take. That's change. That's it can be life changing. And I think it's fulfilling when you when you're we're so used to making decisions that it's like, OK, am I going to am I going to eat out or eat at home today? yeah, it's a pretty big decision in my life right now. I'm going to yeah. have to put a lot of thought into this. There's a, <laughs> there's a big difference in the caliber of those decisions, I think. <laughs> well, let, I mean, let's go back to what you were saying. You're right. You're right. I agree with that. But one thing I, I, I would contend with a little bit is we're like, not everybody can do that. Bullshit. Everybody can do that if they want to do it. Now, that, that's, a different, that's a different conversation. Okay? I'm not telling you everybody has to live my life or your life or – any number of people they might be listening to or following on social media. That's different. But if you want to, then you can. And life is a series of trade-offs. So when I look, here's one of the things that I just, I got absolutely just bought, like completely bothered by. 
when I moved up here to Maine, people were like, Oh, you know, Ryan, I wish I could do that. And I wish I'd blah, blah, blah. And they, then they, nice. would, what they would do is they'd say, but must be nice. Right. And then they would, they would say, but, and then they would put in their excuse of choice, right? Like, but I've got family here, but I've got a job, but I've got bills, but my wife doesn't want to, but my friends would lose or my kids would lose their friends. Dude. I had all of that same stuff. You don't think I had that? You don't think I had responsibility? You don't think I was going to have my kids lose their friends? You don't think we had friends that we liked and enjoyed and, and wanted to be around? I had all of that same stuff. And life is a series of, of trade-offs. You don't get anything without something in return. It just doesn't work like that. And too many of us are looking for ways that we can have our cake and eat it too. You don't get both. You got to choose what's most important to you. And then you got to decide what you're willing to pay for it. And if you aren't willing to pay the price, that's okay. But at least, damn, be honest about it. You tell yourself, hey, you know, that that isn't as important to me as this other thing that I will have to give up in order to have that. And that's fine. At least you made an honest, conscious choice about it. The other thing I was going to mention was this... Um, this concept of like getting wrapped up and riled up about things that don't matter. I had a friend of mine, this was years ago, probably 10 years ago at this point. And she had what she had called, I, I think if I remember correctly, it's like the three hour rule. And anytime that she was upset about something, she would say, is this going to matter in three hours? And if the answer was, yes, it's still going to matter in three hours, then that would lead her towards taking action that would help alleviate the pain or solve the problem. If the answer was no, then she would just forget about it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> this is not going to matter. You know, that dumbass who's posting about how life should be in Montana and criticizing some guy who's on a horseback with his family. That's not going to matter to you in three hours. So just let it go. Yeah. Right. But if it is going to last longer than that, then yeah, I think you, you do. You have an obligation, a responsibility, especially if you're capable of doing so to say something about it, to do something about it, and to begin working towards a solution to that problem you're dealing with. I, I agree. I think it's a thought process and it's similar to what I do. Like when I would say I go chop wood or I go out to the workshop and forge or I'll, I don't know, go swap out some light switches or something, you know, that I need to do is it gives you separation from that, from like your immediate emotional reaction and you step back yeah, and you, sure. you consider it from a more neutral or a more, uh, um, unemotional perspective. And it allows you to make that decision of like, okay, all right. You know, I was heated. Now I can step back and, and, you know, talking about, uh, I should, I should clarify, I guess I phrased that wrong. I didn't necessarily mean that, that not everyone can, you know, again, move out to the middle of nowhere and then live that life. I should say that not everyone is currently in that position to where, sure they're facing those challenges. They may be yeah, you're again, right. yeah, living but in the, the city and they, they need and, other ways to find those challenges for the time being. True, true. Wherever you are, you got to find those challenges. And, and so saying, I can't do that is an incomplete thought. Yeah. Like you're not finishing the sentence. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's okay. And, and you're just like, wait, like when somebody says, well, I can't do that. I'm just like waiting for them to like finish and complete the thought. And they don't usually, and the complete thought is, I can't do that yet, so I am going to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. That's the complete thought. That's the mature thought process of it all. But you're right. If you're not in the position currently, and there are, there's limitations, there's financial constraints, there's time constraints, and a lot of that, let's be honest, is, is of your own doing. It's not anybody else's doing. Uh, and, and if you're dealing with that now currently and you don't have a life that you want to have, then yeah, you have to go out and find that. But one thing that I, that I often say with regards to how we interpret situations and how we get emotional is that objective analysis is greater than subjective interpretation. And so most of us, myself included, tend to default to subjective to interpretation. Yeah, well, Sam said this, and I didn't like the way that it made me feel. Okay, well, that's all <laughs> subjective. That's all open to interpretation. And then what do we do? We make decisions based on it. Sam, maybe you didn't mean that. Maybe you did mean it. Maybe you didn't. Maybe I interpreted it wrong. Maybe I, who knows? There's so many variables there. And then I 
start basing my actions on that, like think about the scientific process. Like think about a, sci- a scientist is like, well, you know, I really feel that this, this is important or that like, that's not what scientists do. Like, I really feel I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't disclose these findings because uh, you know, what if somebody's offended by them? That's modern <laughs> science. That isn't true sci- science with a capital S. That's some, that's all of, science with a capital S is objective. That, look, I'm not saying they get it right all the time. You know, we used to believe that the earth was the center of the universe. And that mm-hmm. was science at that point. But the scientific process has revealed that that's not actually true. But still, it was tr- we were trying to get to a point where there was no subjectivity. There was no interpretation of the data. It was just factual. And the more that we can do that with our own life, the better off we're going to be. You know, for example, if my wife says something to me and I get pissed off about it, I can choose to be pissed off and I can interpret it as her meaning X, Y, and Z. That ain't scientific. That's not objective. I would suggest rather than doing that, what you ought to do is say, hey, hon, you know, you said something earlier at dinner. You said um, you, you said something and uh, I got a little offended by the way that you said it. And, and I'm not sure if you meant it that way or if you did mean it that way, but what did you mean by that? And then give her an opportunity to clarify because maybe you just are completely wrong because you're immature uh, or you looked at it through the lens of past experience uh, or your own culture or belief or background or upbringing or baggage. And maybe she didn't mean that at all, but you didn't give her the opportunity to say, Oh no, that's actually not what I meant because look, she's a human too. And she's going to mess up. Like how often do I try to say something and I end up in, in, in light of me wanting to put something good out into the world, actually end up putting my foot in my mouth. Of course, mm-hmm. I do that all the time. And people interpret it and they interpret it correctly or incorrectly. And, but like, let, let's try to be a little bit more objective. And I think that goes a long way when it comes to emotions is that a lot of us are ruled by our emotions. And so if I'm pissed, something must be wrong. If I'm jealous or I'm greedy or I'm happy or I'm sad or any range of emotions I'm experiencing, I will base my actions on that rather than saying, hold up, let me not be pissed off and let me actually decide if this is the correct response. You know, like guys will say like, I was so pissed and I punched a hole in the wall. Okay, but that's not mature behavior. Like it is, you know, please tell me guys, you know that it's possible to be pissed off and not punch a hole in the wall. Like I've done that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure most people, most men listening have probably at some point punched a hole in the wall. But that doesn't mean like being angry doesn't equate to punching a hole in the wall. It's just what you decided to do because you were angry. They're two distinct things. Mm -hmm. So maybe instead what we should focus on is, hey, I'm angry right now. Pause, time out, disengage. Why am I angry? Well, I'm angry because of this. Is it objective analysis or is it subjective interpretation? Well, subjective interpretation. Good. How can you figure out how to make it more objective analysis? And then I think you will find that we won't be so emotionally reactive to these triggers in our lives. And there's a difference too, also between being reactive and being responsive. Like reaction is emotional. You don't think about it. It's the first thing that happened. Like this happened. I'm pissed. React. Respond is this happened. I'm pissed. I'm, I'm upset about it, but why am I upset? And what's the best course of action? That's a response, not necessarily reactivity. It's I'll, I'll admit, I got so invested in what you were saying. I, my mind just went completely blank on what I was going to ask you next. Um, I was, that's, it's like, dude, that's the mark of a good conversation. There we go. Think about what we're thinking next. Let's just oh, yeah. flow. Well, it is funny. You know, I, I've, I've, I've said this a few times before. I, I, I'll have guests on and it happens a lot with other podcasters too, especially when I've listened to the podcast. I'll, I'll be sitting and, you know, I'm, I'm listening and, and I'm, I'm listening. I'm enjoying the conversation. I'm listening to the the podcast and I'm waiting for the host to ask another question. And, and then all of a sudden I realize I am the host and I'm like, Oh shoot, that's right. I got to it. But that's an interesting thing. I've, I've actually, so we've had a lot of success podcasting, you know, I've been podcasting for six and a half years now. We've had, I don't know, 45 million plus downloads on the podcast. I've done over 850 podcasts at this point. Um, we've had guys like, 
uh, Steve Rinella on the podcast and Ben Shapiro and Dan Crenshaw and just incredible people. Oh, yeah. very, very, w- whether you agree with them or not, like they're prolific, notable, popular people, people that, that others pay attention to. Uh, and I made the decision a long time ago to move from being a podcast host. Like I don't even describe myself as that to a conversationalist. That, and that's not an insignificant difference. A podcast host has some level of responsibility of like guiding the converse. And we do, we do have yeah. some, some responsibility to guide the conversation, but it like puts too much of the burden on you as a person to make sure this is a good interview versus just, and that's what we're having today is just having a conversation. And that's and like, just, just conversing and where oh, it goes, yeah. it goes. Well, from day one of the podcast, like I always, you know, you, you come in, I'm sure you probably still remember starting out and being like, this is weird, man. What am I, you know, like, what am I supposed to be doing yeah. here? And, uh, you know, I, and I came to realize those conversations, the ones that were just conversations were the best. The ones, if I had a list of questions or this or that, you know, <laughs> yeah. or the, I used it, to do that. Oh gosh. It's, and I like, you know, I try and do a little bit of, I mean, it's easy with you. We've, we've been on the podcast we've before and we've other. known each other. Sure. And so it's not, I don't have to like do a bunch of research about who you are. And most of my guests I'm asking them on because I found them in something about them. Interesting. So I already know the direction I'm going to go. And, uh, and you know, so it's, I, I love those conversations and I feel like people relate to them more because it's like a conversation you'd have with someone at a bar or, around a, you know, at hunting camp or by a campfire or wherever you may be just, you know, on a walk with somebody, it's those conversations people relate with because it's a conversation they'd have. Um, and, and I absolutely love that. And I, I didn't realize you'd been running it for that for six and a half years. Um, yeah. I was thinking I, about it earlier, earlier this year, how long it's been. Cause it doesn't feel like that long either, but yeah, we started in March of 2015. So March of next year will be seven years. I was it's gonna say crazy. it's 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 really funny all the parallels because I started I started mine in March. I'm coming up on five years this March, um, mm-hmm. and uh, it's I was just I was just laughing because there's so many parallels. You know, both grew up in Southern California, both started hunting. I mean, I think we started hunting probably the same season in 2017 was my first real. Yeah, let's see, let me think about it here for a second. Twenty, yeah, I think it was to, it's November of I think it was November of 20. 17 because this is my this november was my fifth year hunting so yeah that's yep. that's right so it's, yeah that's right it's just it's it's wild uh uh it's just it, i it's just wild thinking and thinking about the the progress through that and i mean you've you've had the podcast going for quite a while and i think we talked about this some in the last episode but uh you've had the podcast going for quite a while before ever getting into hunting, ever, it ever becoming a thing. Yeah. Like two and a half years before I even started hunting, but the podcast is what, what afforded me the opportunity to meet my friend, Colin Cottrell, who got mm-hmm. me into hunting. Oh yeah. But yeah, it was two and a half years. Well, and it's funny. I want to say uh, two or three weeks after we recorded that episode, I had Colin on and it was kind of fun getting, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Cause I've talked with Colin, uh, for quite a while. And it wasn't until I had you on that. I realized I made that whole connection and Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he and I had a great conversation. We kind of talked about, it was kind of cool having the mirror side uh, of our, of mine and yours conversation with him kind of from the Uh the other perspective of it. It was, it was a really cool follow-up to that episode. Um, Yeah. Colin and I actually hunted um, a month ago or so in Minnesota. I shot the biggest deer of my life, which was awesome. Uh, and Colin was out there, which, you know, wasn't ironic to me that he's the one who got me into hunting and he was there when I shot that deer, which, you know, didn't go completely according to plan, but we got it done. Um, it's like just crazy times. This hunting world has been awesome. Like, there's no other way to say it. So, I mean, it, it, turning it more to hunting, like what over the, over these past five years that you've been hunting what are some of the the biggest changes you've seen in yourself when it comes to that? Or maybe some of the, the things you've learned that you look back, you're like, Oh man, if I'd only known this when I went on that first trip or when I started going out, what are some of these things you've seen over these past few years as a, 
like, I guess the adult onset hunter like myself. Yeah. I mean, look, you, you don't, nobody needs to hunt. That's, that's the ease of modernity <laughs> that we live in. Like, I don't need to hunt. You don't need to hunt Dudley, Cam Haynes, Rogan, like these guys you see who are like the, the, the hunters that we see, like they don't need to hunt. You can just go down to the grocery store. You can talk to a neighbor and get some beef. Like you, nobody needs to hunt, but that's what makes it so meaningful is because you choose to do it. We were already talking about this, you know, making that conscious choice to go out and do something. And there's no, look, here's the other thing. There's no consequence of not hunting. You're not going to starve if you don't hunt, you'll be fine. And so this is a voluntary choice and, and making this voluntary choice for me to learn how to be proficient with a firearm, learn how to be proficient with a bow and a little arrow I mean, think about that arrow, for example. My son was out shooting the other day, my oldest, because he's getting into it. And he, he's not shooting the poundage where, you know, you can't really totally see the arrow. He's shooting a poundage where you can kind of follow the, the path of that arrow a little bit more accurately. Mm -hmm. And you can see it. Like, it's not, it's like it's wobbling and it's like all over the place. And, and it still hits the target as long as you're doing it right. And he was commenting on it. And like, it was just, it was so interesting that, to see like how we can take this little stick with a pointy end and put it through uh, some, some carbon fiber with some string on it and actually kill an animal. That's crazy. That's crazy. And then you think about, I was at uh, the Smithsonian, I believe it was in Washington DC several months ago. And there I saw, uh, it was a, it was a, a bone of a horse that had a hole in it. And the researchers that determined that that hole in that bone, it was like a hip bone, if I remember correctly, was made from a human who had thrown a spear to kill the horse, which they later went on to cook and eat. And they knew they cooked and ate it because of the tools and things they found near the horse bones that they had mm -hmm. discovered. We've been doing this since the dawn of man, hundreds of thousands of years. Even before Homo sapiens, we've been doing this. And that's pretty incredible to be able to tap into that when you don't need to. You're not going to die if you don't, but you're going to choose to do it because it's going to make you a better human being. You're going to develop patience. You're going to work, work towards uh, a proficiency and mastery. You're going to be able to connect with other people and build a community that you never would have built before. It's been a very, very cool ride. And I'm not an like I'm not what you would call an avid hunter. My son is. He's a freak. He's crazy. <laughs> like if if he could do anything any day, all day, every night, it would be hunting. I'm not like that. He's more of that than I am for sure. And yet it's just been so good as a supplemental. I don't even like saying it like that because it is integral, but it, but a supplemental integral part of of my life. It's, I mean, and it, it is something you can, you do have the ability to focus on for the entire year, even aside from just, I mean, it's, oh, yeah. you know, there's so much to hunt. Like you, you can predator hunt most places year round, you know, coyotes, varmint hunt, things like that. Um, there's ducks, there's upland game, there's, there's deer, there's elk, there's, you know, there's stuff year round, most places that you can chase. And those times that you're not actually out hunting, there's countless amounts of work to be done, you know, and depending on the style of hunting you want to do, you know, if you want to bow hunt, that is a perishable skill. I'll tell you what, like, you know, you, you have to dedicate yourself to practice and mastery of that, at, at least yeah. if you want to be an ethical hunter, um, you know, there's, if you want to, if you want to hunt mountains, you damn well better be physically prepared. I mean, yeah, there's, there's trails there's You can get cars a lot more places than you used to be able to, but if you want to find success and you want to find a lot of those big bulls, you've or big bulls or bucks, you've got to be prepared to move your ass in there and then haul some stuff out. Um, and that takes preparation. That's not something you can do the week before the season and suddenly expect to be able to, hike 2000 feet in elevation over the, you know, half a mile. <laughs> um, 
it's it, it's going to wreck you. I like what you're saying. It is. It's going to mess with you. And I like what you're saying about being prepared, not just in hunting season, but year round. You know, we think about this property here that we have. We we've we've tilled and planted. We've got a food plot. And we've we've put cameras out, and we're mapping the deer. And so my son and I were talking about it this year because our season. Uh, just came to a close. We were going to do muzzleloader, but we're not. But so our season just came to a close. And unfortunately for the second year being out here, we didn't, we didn't shoot a deer. And so we were a little discouraged, but then we started thinking about it. We're like, man, but we've got some big bucks coming in. Like we've got, we've done all this work. We've got more bucks coming in. And so I was going to show you this. We've got this awesome deer right here. I don't know if you can see him. Oh, nice. Yeah. We've got this awesome, he's, he's a nine point white tail, you know, main white mm -hmm. tail. He's big body, nice, big full rack. I don't know that I've seen a deer like this really anywhere in Maine, even based on what friends have shot. And this is a guy that comes into our food plot regularly. We've got another six or seven deer that are coming into our food plot bucks that are coming into our food plot regularly. And, you know, we haven't, we haven't put one on the ground yet, but hopefully next year or the following year, or maybe we never do, you know, I don't know, but the fact that we have them coming in based on our hard work over 11 months doesn't really diminish the fact that in that one month we didn't get it done. We, we, we just do so much work year round. And, and I don't think a lot of people see that, you know, they, they, they think that, you know, you go out and you go sit somewhere for an hour or whatever and shoot something. And then you're done. It's like, I wish I kind of sometimes wish it was like that, <laughs> but it's never like, it hasn't been like I, that for me anyways. I came pretty close this year to that. I, I, I just, because of the move, I, I did not get much time out in the field. Uh, I didn't, I, I had some other stuff going on during archery season. So I only got out a few times and, you know, I'm up on this property here and I'm surrounded by farm fields. So we've got some beefy whitetail like they just all they eat is wheat all year long mm -hmm. and so we yeah. got some big chesty you know whitetail out here and uh there there was a couple of mornings where uh where i was drinking my coffee uh i it was a, a friday call there's one friday call actually we we're halfway through the call and i look up out my window and there are two big old bucks and four doe or like three or four doe uh, on my neighbor's property, like just over the property line. And it looked like they were feeding this way. So I like, I like grabbed my laptop, you know, I, I, I think I may have switched to the phone for a minute and I'm like throwing on my camo, just like a camo jacket or something. And I creeping outside. I'm like, all right, I better, better mute the call for a minute. <laughs> for a minute. And, uh, but I, I didn't manage, but it came real close to me sitting there with my coffee, looking outside and being like, Oh, Hey, look at deer. Boom. But uh, they ended up they ended up feeding well, uh, also, across the street. But that's also the law of large numbers, too. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, like so. I think about this in the context of UFC. A lot of guys, like I remember when Conor McGregor was the shit, right? And mm -hmm. this wasn't that long ago, really. And and people would take his 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 pay for a fight, and then they would calculate it based on his like Jose Aldo fight, where he was in there for thirteen seconds, and he's like, he made. 1,800,000 per second or whatever, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, and it's like, okay, like I get where you're coming from on that, but that actually isn't accurate because for the 10 years plus prior, he's been training every day. He's yeah. been in other fights and it's that that got him to that point. So I think about that with hunting. Yeah. Maybe as a new hunter, you just like happen to stumble across something and you get lucky. But for the most part, you know, when you have a day like that, I have a friend uh, who I trained jujitsu with. He's a hunter. Last year, year, excuse me, he shot the second biggest deer in Maine oh, for damn. the season. For the season, and the way he tells the story is, he like basically like went outside and saw a deer was there. Went inside, grabbed his rifle, and shot it. <laughs> and so you'd think, oh well, that guy's lucky, and maybe that was luck. Like, I'm not going to say it's not luck. Like there's some fortunate circumstances to that. He happened to go outside. The deer happened to be there. He happened to have his gun by it. Like he happened to live at that property. But then I talked to him this year and I've talked to him about other years and, you know, he's been out working the land and buying property and feeding and scouting. And like, it's all of that that really adds up to a successful hunt and so I look at these guys who are able to do it consistently day in and day out, year after year after year. And I think, 
you know, that isn't luck. These guys are making that happen through their work that nobody else sees and very few people are willing to do. Oh yeah. Well, and that's one of the things I'm really excited about with this property. It's like I mentioned earlier, I'm planting trees like a crazy person right now. You know, some of it's for a windbreak, but I'm creating habitat. I'm going to be planting one of my fields with alfalfa. I'm going to be digging, a, you know, this is probably further down the line because it's going to need some equipment, but I'm planning on digging like a three quarter acre pond uh, and stocking it. And so there, there'll be water on the property. There'll be food, mm. there'll be bedding, there'll be, you know, I'm, I'm looking at creating a little ideal situation. So my ass has a spot where if I don't feel like going out and doing an adventure hunt for mule deer and climbing the mountains where it's like, I'm like, okay, I'll do that for elk. I can shoot a nice big whitetail here on my own property. That's, that's yeah. money. That's like the best of both worlds as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah. I've got a friend who I've been hunting. So this buck, I shot this buck. He was 290 pounds on the hoof. So he's huge. Ooh, yeah. And that's the deer I shot this year in, in Minnesota. And this is my fourth year out there. And I was talking with my buddy, Matt, about it. And he's the one who owns the land and they manage it and everything else. And, you know, he, ta- he says a lot of people think they're lucky about this property they have and how many deer are in there. And they're all the big bucks are in there and they, they want to come hunt. And this is pretty, pretty cool place. And oh, he says that when he bought that place, there wasn't a deer to be found <laughs> anywhere. But him and his dad and his brother spent countless, literally countless hours grooming and scouting and planting and sowing and tilling and putting up stands and checking cameras. And now, yeah, it's this beautiful place with lots of good deer. But that took years and years to develop. And nobody wants to look at that side of the equation. They just oh, yeah. want to look at the result, the answer to the equation. No, I mean, I think they, I think it's like that with just about anything, whether, yeah, again, it's, it's hunting or, you know, it, you probably get this with order of man all the time and the following you have built yeah. that where it's like, you know, oh, well, you know, must, again, it must be nice, you know, to, <laughs> it is nice. It's really yeah. nice. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the only appropriate response. Oh, that must be nice that you get to do this. Yeah, it is nice. <laughs> and I had to build it, but now it's kind of nice actually. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> if it, if it wasn't nice, I probably wouldn't be doing it. So, you know, thank exactly. you. You have thusly stated the obvious. Or but I, if it didn't have the potential, you know, I'd still be doing it if I was grinding through it, but if it yeah. didn't have the oh, yeah. potential of leading me to some level of fulfillment, then yeah, of course I wouldn't be doing it. So yeah, it is nice. Now it wasn't <laughs> always nice and it always isn't nice. You know, there's times where I'm like, I don't want to do this. This is not one of them, by the way, but there's times <laughs> where I'm like, I don't want to do that podcast or I don't want to jump on the call with this guy or I don't want to send this email. And yet I do it because that's what the job requires. Yeah. It's it, again. Yeah. People don't, people want to see the good stuff. They want to see the results. They don't want to see everything behind it, whether that's, you know, for me, I, I get a lot of people that think, Oh, you know, I, I get all this stuff handed to me get all this stuff for free. I'm like, I barely get anything for free every so often, you know, like I'll, get a I'll t-shirt or something. you know, I'll run in like John Barklow and he'll, he'll hook me up with the jacket, which I like, I'm like, holy crap, this is real nice. Um, yeah, for sure. No doubt. And, uh, and you know, and that, and that happens like once a year for me. Um, and, and everyone's like, oh, it must be nice. I'm like, okay, you know, all right. So let's, let's consider that jacket payment, you know, whatever. A, a sick of jacket, you know, 300 bucks. You know, it's probably more than that. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you say like 300 bucks. I'm like, okay. I have that jacket because of, of the work I've done over the past five years, building this brand, you know, uh, spending my hours on the podcast, whatever that is. That accounts for maybe like three hours of my time <laughs> recording, recording the podcast. That doesn't account for the editing, the, the time spent, everything else that goes into it. So it's just, it's, uh, again, people don't want to look at what goes into it doesn't uh, you know it's just it's wild to me that and then people get so entitled to when you have a following to your time and your attention and they feel like you owe them something um it's it's amazing 
that entitlement that comes when you when you gain that kind of a following. Yeah, I mean, look, every once in a while, somebody on social media will say, and they'll phrase it differently, but a lot of the times it's, well, you shouldn't have said it this way. You should have said it that way. Who's who taught? You should have said it that way. <laughs> like, if you have a better way to say it, you go say it that way. Like, who are you to tell me what a better way to say it is? You know, and so on, on Instagram alone, we have over 100,000 people following us. You think the world revolves around you? You think every post I make is about you or it should land for you? Man, how narcissistic do you need to be to believe that everything I'm doing is supposed to land directly with you? And if it doesn't, that you, you know, have the, have the right or gall or audacity to correct me because it doesn't land with you. It's like so self-absorbed. <laughs> it's it's wild it's wild i love i love seeing some of the responses and some of the comments on your posts man uh it's hilarious it's you hilarious know, so, people so, are like comical so you know we've mentioned we brought up order of man several times uh you know we, we've touched on the iron council as well i want to give you a stage that uh kind of kind of give your pitch talk a little bit about it um you know the podcast and and what order of man is for those who don't know yeah, I mean, like if I strip everything away from it, Order of Man is an organization to give men tools they need, resources they need, conversations they need to hear, whatever they need to thrive as a man in whatever way they're showing up. So if you're a dad and you're trying to figure out how to be a better dad, we're going to have some conversations on fatherhood. If you're a husband who's trying to reconnect with his wife because you've had a, a rough year or two or five or even a decade, we're going to give you some tools that you need to have deeper, better conversations with your wife or learn how to communicate more effectively with her. If you're a business owner or an employee and you're trying to figure out how to grow your business or start a business or secure the promotion or get a raise, we're going to have conversations, give you tools, uh, give you different mindsets and ways of thinking that are going to help you secure that promotion or grow that business or start the business. So I know it's really broad, but we serve men, you know, and if you're, if you're, a, if you're a male and you want to, and there's a distinction here, if you're a male and you want to learn how to become more of a man, there's a difference, then we have the tools for you. That's it. Like conversations, we have events, we have, our iron council, which is our exclusive brotherhood. You're part of that. So we're just trying to do whatever we can to serve men more effectively and in, in the way that they want to show up for their lives, their, their families, their businesses, and their communities. You know, it's, it's interesting watching a lot of guys kind of go through the, the process to somewhat, you know, maybe they're listening to the podcast and then they find the Facebook group and uh, then they, they find sovereignty. The uh, you wrote a book sovereignty uh, that, that touches on all those, those topics. Um, and I'll make sure to link to that uh, on the show notes page. Um, get that pretty much anywhere, anywhere books are sold. Um, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, it's interesting watching that process and then, you know, they kind of make that decision and, I feel like so many guys and, you know, maybe this is just me patting myself on the back a little bit, but like, I feel like when people, when guys join the iron council, it's, they're making that, that real decision then at that point uh, to invest in themselves and, and really invest in becoming better men. Cause I, you know, it's so easy for people to kind of play act at it and put on this facade of, yes, I'm improving as a man. And, um, but then once you kind of dig in and, and you actually invest in yourself and join something like the iron council, um, you, you see a whole new caliber of people that are willing to do that. Well, yeah, I mean, it requires sacrifice. That's the difference. So you can play the part and you can say you're doing the things. And, and if all you're doing is scrolling through social media, like, is that, does that require a sacrifice? No. So that's not going to actually improve yourself. So when it comes to investing in yourself, there has to be, we talked about earlier, you have to give something in return. There is a trade-off and the trade-off might be a hundred bucks a month because that's what you're paying to be part of, part of the organization. Uh, or it might be jumping on a Thursday morning call with your battle team and having a conversation with 12 other guys about what they're dealing with and what you're not. Now, could you be doing other things? Yes, you could hundred percent. There's a lot of other things you could be doing, but that's the trade-off. 
And unless you're willing to give value or trade, then you're actually not improving. You're just coasting. What I was going to say, even in the Iron Council, and I mean, I'm not going to call out any names, but there are guys in the Iron Council that pay their fee and they're like, I'm becoming a better man. And they, they, they want to sit and play act at it just by paying the fee. There's more sacrifice that's required to that. And like you said, like, I mean, you know, we've got our teams within, within the Iron Council. These guys you develop a close relationship with. And I remember when I joined and, you know, it was, it was funny. I, I was familiar with Order Man and, you know, I, I, I'd heard of the Iron Council and kind of looked at it prior to our podcast. And then after we spoke, I'm, I, but I was always kind of like, I was like, hey, you know, whatever. It, it's cool and all, but whatever. And after we spoke, I'm like, you know what? Okay. I just quit my job. I just started my own business. I was working for myself full time. I had all of this stuff going on. And I'm like, you know what? This sounds like something that could be beneficial to me. I'm going to try it just for a quarter. I signed up for on a quarterly basis because I'm like, one month, that's not enough to give it a real chance. I wanted to give it a real chance. And, uh, you know, so it was after our podcast, I'm like, okay, I'll check this out out of sheer curiosity. And I think I was like three days in, I, I, it took me like a week or two. I'd signed up. It took me a week or two to kind of like actually get into it. But once I was in, I was like three days in and I was like, all right, I'm sold. I'm like a lifetime. (laughs) I'm like, nah, you've been a great contributor to what we're doing. And and I think you're dead on, but look, so Oh, but what I was, what I was going to say, what I was, what I was, what I was trying to get, I kind of got off on a tangent was, is there's, there's guys even in that, that'll, that'll coast. There's more sacrifice that's required. And it's making that decision to sacrifice on a consistent basis for, for that growth. Like for me, when I joined, I wanted, I was like, all right, I'm going to have to do something that's like a little over and above challenging for me if I'm going to stay invested, like I have to really commit to this. And so I joined a battle team where at the time I was on, I was on Pacific time. My battle team calls were Saturday morning at four 30 in the morning. Like, Let's talk about a sacrifice for a minute. Um, That's what I'm talking about, you know, there's, there's time allotted. There's time to develop your battle plans. There's time with your team. There's, roles you can take on in the iron council whether you're moderating a channel or doing this that or the other and it's a choice to make that consistent sacrifice the more sacrifice you make the more growth and more value you're going to see and gain out of something like that yeah you'll get some value just by paying the fee and joining the calls whatever and you know sitting back but when it's when you engage and when you give and and make those additional um uh, uh, consistent sacrifices that you really see the needle start to move and you see that growth start to happen. Yeah. I mean, you hit on what I was going to say, which is that sacrifice is subjective. You know, what's effort for you might be different for me. So if, for example, you're saying to yourself, well, you know, I work out five days a week and most of the guys don't work out at all. Does that mean you're sacrificing? No, not if the five days of working out is easy for you. It's not a sacrifice. Like if it comes easy and it's convenient and it's comfortable, or you've already built that habit and it's no longer hard, then it's not a sacrifice. It's just part of your day. So it's all subjective. And I can't tell you what is easy or hard or what's the sacrifice or what isn't. And so that's why I liked what you said, where I, I need to push myself outside of my comfort zone, which is joining a team and I can meet them at 4.30 a.m. on Saturday morning. Okay, that's more sacrificial Cause you have to get up and you have to jeopardize your sleep. And there's other things you couldn't want to be doing. It's again, it's all superficial. Uh, excuse me. Uh, it's all subjective, not superficial. Yeah. Subjective is definitely not superficial. <laughs> it's no, definitely not, not super. Yeah. It, I mean, it's like, I, I went in and I'm like, okay, if I'm going to give this an honest chance, I'm, I'm going balls to the wall with this. And I mean, I, I you know, and I loved it. It has had such an effect on me and I've had my, and I've had my, my ebbs and flows in my interaction and my involvement. And it's been, you know, it's weird thinking it's been, I'm coming up on uh, two years now um, with that, which is, it's part of how I remembered how long ago our podcast was. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, coming in, this is probably going to release. I got to look at the dates. This will, this will release beginning, uh, beginning to the mid December. And now with the iron council, there's a, there's a new format as far as how people can join, uh, things like that. So the timing I want to say is probably going to be pretty solid, 
uh, with the release of this podcast, I'd love, you know, for you to explain how, how this is happening now for, for new guys that want to yeah, get, I mean, get involved. We, we closed it down. We closed registration to the iron council. So for the past month or so, and we open it up December 1st. So as of recording, it actually opens up tomorrow, December 1st. Uh, and then we're going to go for about two to three weeks. We've got a hundred spots available for what we're calling our cohort. So for the first cohort of 2022, we've got a hundred spots available, no less, no, no more. That's it. And so when we had a hundred spots, that's when we're going to shut it down, close it off. And we're going to, we're going to lock it up for the next quarter so that we can spend time getting these hundred men on board, ramped up quickly, familiar with our processes and systems. We can focus a lot of our time, energy, and attention on the guys that are already there rather than having to recruit all throughout the quarter. Uh, and this is new, you know, I'd really think it's going to help us give the attention to our new members who deserve it as they're getting onboarded and give our attention to the existing members uh, so that we can focus heavily on them versus having to recruit people. So, yeah, I don't know when this is coming out, but I, I based on what you just said, you probably ought to look at it pretty quick if you're wanting to <laughs> sign up for the Iron Council. Well, definitely, I'll look at the dates and I'll definitely try and get this released earlier if I can to make sure uh, you know folks have have that time in the in the first cool. yeah. in the second or third week of of December to. Uh, uh, to hop on board to to get involved you know and again i uh, know that's one of my favorite things you've posted was the uh the uh the you're a misogynistic cult <laughs> um it's it just every time i scroll past that on on your instagram i just it just makes me smile and laugh because it's it's uh, my reaction to that would have been like well you know we're trying but we're just not very good at it you know <laughs> like it's yeah I mean, I, I think I said something like, you know, we're the worst cult ever. We, we, uh, people can come and go anytime we teach them individual responsibility. We suggest they go out and lead their families and their businesses and their communities. Well, there's no secret handshakes, no blood offerings. There's no cult leader like myself who you're <laughs> having to pledge your blind allegiance to. So if we are a cult, we are the worst cult ever. And we'd love to have you here. We got plenty of Kool-Aid for you. Yeah. I mean, we won't, we won't talk about the blood offerings required to join team Charlie, but uh, that's, you know, that's, I mean, that's individual that's battle team teams stuff. Are different. Just... Teams are different. Teams decide what they want for themselves and what their culture is, but <laughs> which is, which is, you know, cult culture, being the reward is cult. So that that's up to you guys. We go. How you, how you want to do that outside of that? <laughs> it's not very cult like at all. <laughs> oh, wait. Um, so where can folks find uh, order man, iron council, where can they find the podcast? All of that good stuff. Yeah. I mean, you're listening to a podcast. So if you just type in order of man, wherever you're listening right now, you're going to find us. Uh, you can go to order man.com order man.com slash iron council. If you want to learn about that. Uh, and then you can find me on the socials at Ryan Mickler. My last name's M I C H L E R Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. You can find us all through those mediums and outlets. Awesome. I'll make sure uh, to link to those on the show notes page. They'll be on the wild Uh, dude, glad we got to connect again. I mean, I'll, I guess I'll be seeing you in what, like three days anyway. Um, yes, sir. It is it is kind of funny. Like you hopped on, I immediately had this just like reaction. Like I was hopping onto a Friday call early or something. Yeah. It looks the same. Right. It's exactly. just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just on it's zoom. Funny. It's another, another Friday call, but uh, it's another day, just another day, but glad, uh, glad we were able to make this happen. Uh, glad you're able to hop on. Thanks again. Me too. Thanks brother. I appreciate you having me on in the conversation today. All right, y'all, that'll do it for this episode of The Wild Initiative. Make sure to check out the show notes page at thewildinitiative.com. Get links to everything we talked about in today's episode. Big thank you to Ryan. Uh, he is a very busy guy. I appreciate him taking the time out of his schedule to hop on, sit down, and uh, catch up with me again. Y'all, make sure to check out the Order Man podcast. Check out the Order Man. All you gentlemen out there, head on over to the orderofman.com slash iron council. Get signed up. Trust me, this is an investment you will not regret making. This has been life changing for me over the course of the past two years. And, uh, you know, I, I guarantee if you put in the work, keep in mind, this is just a tool. This is not a magic bullet. If you put in the work, 
this can be absolutely life-changing for y'all. So make sure to check that out. But y'all, that'll do it for this week. Looking forward to next time. But until then, I hope this episode inspired you to get involved, get outdoors, and plan your initiative for the wild. Thank you for listening to The Wild Initiative. Please take a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher and head on over to thewildinitiative.com to get show notes, check out the blog, gear discounts, other podcasts from The Wild Initiative family, and more. 